This week on Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately? No one wants to admit they need help. We distrust leaders who don't have a plan, who seem weak and confused. But it's in that place that God can truly work with us. In chapter 10 of Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately? The late David Wilkerson reminds us that we can't save ourselves. Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately? is brought to you by World Challenge, a ministry that strives to help all mankind live a better life and make a better world through Jesus Christ. Each week, this podcast reaches thousands of listeners with biblical encouragement and thoughtful commentary. This critical work is made possible by the generous contributions of individuals like you. Please consider joining our donors who believe in World Challenge's mission. You can do that on our website, worldchallenge.org. Now, Chapter 10, When You Don't Know What to Do, read by Jason Staples. What would you think if our president, addressing the nation on network TV, confessed, We don't really know what to do. Your leaders are confused, and we have no sense of direction. That would be some kind of speech. The nation would be convulsed with ridicule and scorn for him and all his associates. That is exactly what King Jehoshaphat did. Three enemy armies were closing in on Judah, and this mighty leader called the nation together at Jerusalem to formulate a war plan. He needed plans, a decisive declaration of action. Something had to be done immediately. Instead, Jehoshaphat stood before his people and poured his heart out to God in confession. Second Chronicles 20, 11, and 12 says, Behold, I say, how they reward us, to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. What kind of war plan is that? No program, no committee action, no flying banners, no bright and shiny war machinery, no brilliant war plans, no blaring of trumpets or mustering of patriotic armies, just a simple confession. We are in this over our heads. We don't know what to do, so we will just keep our eyes on the Lord. They decided to stand still, admit their confusion, and put all their eggs in one basket. They would not move anywhere but closer to their Lord. They would look no other place for help but to Him. Does it all sound cowardly and ridiculous? Well-armed enemy troops surrounded them, and vultures filled the skies waiting for the battle to begin. They just stood together praising God, admitting they didn't know what to do next, and looked only to Him for deliverance. Nowadays, when we get into trouble, we act as if we are saying, Lord, I love you, but I already know what I'm going to do. When the enemy comes in like a flood, we panic. We feel we must do something, make something move, or give. We have a need to see things happen, and we feel guilty if we are not constantly proving to God how willing we are to do anything He requires of us. The urge to make things happen comes to us all. A divorced mother worried about her little boy's insecurity since his dad left home. That child wouldn't let his mother out of his sight. He screamed and called for his daddy. All the love this mother showered on him didn't seem to be enough. What did this Christian mother do? She called her friends for advice. She researched books on child raising, looking for solutions. She went about her day in worrisome concern, thinking to herself, I've just got to do something about this problem before it gets out of hand. There is a better way. It's absolutely scriptural for that mother to throw up her hands and cry, It's too much for me. I've tried my best. I don't know whom to turn to or what to do. No one can help me. So I'll just stay close to Jesus, keep my eyes only on Him, and trust He will see me through. A perplexed couple was on the verge of giving up. They wanted to give 100% to Jesus, but they had been exposed to legalistic preaching of fear, which had brought them under bondage. They got swept into the charismatic movement, hoping to find joy and fulfillment. One preacher warned them, Jesus says you must be perfect. He would never ask us to do something we couldn't do. To say you must sin a little each day is a cop-out. Another preacher said, if you're not 100% obedient, Jesus cannot save you. Another added, delayed obedience is disobedience. Any disobedience can damn you. 
Now they worry about all the things they forgot to do, about their imperfections and daily battles with the flesh, and they feel defeated. Recently, they picked up an evangelist newsletter that warned, On Judgment Day, there will be many Christians who have been to church three times a week, prayed in tongues, given prophecies, taught Sunday school, and served as deacons who have not read their Bibles enough and prayed enough. God is angry with people who sin every day. He is determined to punish them eternally. There is no hope unless they stop sinning completely. Now they also worry about not having prayed, given, and read their Bibles enough to please God. They live in constant fear. They have been told various things about their fear. Some claimed a demon of fear had crept into them. Others told them they were guilty of a wrong confession, and they were urged not to accept that fear. Just confess victory, they were told, and all will be well. The wife said, We have become so miserable in our efforts to clean ourselves up for God. Every night we evaluate our day and always feel God is displeased because we somehow failed to behave right, to confess right, or to do right. We promise to do better tomorrow, but these are the things that make us want to give up and quit trying. We've lost our sense of peace and security. This is not the abundant life. It is fear. Doesn't the cross of Jesus mean more than that? What should they do? They wonder now who is right, the Charismatics or the Baptists. Their faith is shaken, and they have lost their sense of direction. Which teacher is right? They all seem to have such good arguments and plenty of scriptures to prove their points. What is holiness? What does God expect? Did God do it all for me at the cross, or do I have to muster up my own strength and work out my own salvation with fear and trembling? It's very confusing. My answer? Admit your confusion. Don't seek out pat answers to all these questions. Don't run around looking for teachers to give you solutions and answers. You don't know what to do or where to go? Good. Very good. Now you are ready to do it God's way. Now you can say with Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I've decided to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. Quit looking to those preachers and teachers. Go yourself to the Lord. Get your eyes on him, and with Jehoshaphat, cry aloud, My eyes are fixed on you. A couple in Iowa is trying to save their marriage. They've been married 15 years, and the last five have been unbearable. Both have skeletons in their closets, and both have been guilty of taking their vows lightly. He cheated, and she almost did. For five years, they've tried to forgive each other, but the marriage is not fulfilling now. They pledge their love to each other, but each of them knows something is wrong. They can't put their fingers on it. They're lonely, even when together. They're not reaching each other, and the harder they try, the more frustrated they become. They'll have a good week, when suddenly everything seems to be patched up and going well. Then suddenly it all breaks down, and silent anger and resentment take over. She cries herself to sleep. He thinks of giving up. In a way, they're still attracted to each other. In another way, they seem to be allergic to each other. They've tried to talk their problems through. They've made promises they couldn't keep. They've read books seeking help. They've been to a marriage counselor. But nothing brings about an honest solution. They have both reached a place where there is no turning back. They simply do not know what to do or where to go for help. Is there any solution? I think so. All marriages, even good ones, have their periods of stress. But some marriages can't be healed at all outside of genuine miracles. When two people have tried everything, when it dawns on them that there is no place to go for help, when confusion and panic take over, that is when God has to intervene. Once again, all you can do in such a crisis is do as King Jehoshaphat. Don't be afraid of your confusion. You aren't the only one up against a wall. God specializes in hopeless cases. God takes over when we give up trying to work it all out ourselves. This couple with a marriage about to hit the rocks must stop looking for help outside of the Lord. They must commit their problems and their lives over to the Lord and pray, God, it's over our heads. We've tried and failed. It looks so hopeless, so we'll just stand in your presence and look only to you for help. It's you, Lord, or nothing. Our eyes will stay fixed on you. 
you too face crises in which you don't know what to do or where to go for help. What about you? Is it a financial crisis staring you right in the face? Do you live in a home situation that tears your spirit apart? Have your children hurt you? Or has a child brought anguish to you? Has sickness or pain brought you down to the valley of death? Have you lost a job? Is your future scary and uncertain? Is your marriage in trouble? Has the death of a loved one left you depressed, lonely, and empty? Has a divorce left you feeling like a rejected failure? Do you feel overwhelmed right now? Have you tried so many ways to see it through, yet nothing seems to help? Have you grown tired of trying? Have you almost decided there is no way out? Have you reached the end of your rope? Have you said to your heart, I don't know what to do now? We are living in a time when everything is getting shaky and insecure, and almost everybody is hurting in one way or another. Hardly anybody knows what to do anymore. Our leaders don't have the foggiest idea of what's happening to this world or to the economy. The future is anybody's guess. The business world is even more confused. Economists are arguing with each other about what's coming. There's not a single businessman or economist in the world today who knows for certain where we are headed. Psychologists and psychiatrists are baffled by the changing forces affecting people today. They watch the breakup of homes and marriages and become as confused as the rest of us as to why it's happening. Their reasons contradict each other. It can even be confusing for Christians nowadays. Ministers admonish us to face our problems by looking into the Bible for ourselves, finding our own answers. But the Bible doesn't always specify, this you must do. There's not always a direct answer for your specific problem. At times, unless the Spirit gives you a special revelation, you can get confused by verses that seem on the surface to be contradictory. At one place you read, Sell all you have and give to the poor. Then you read, If a man neglect his own house, he is worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. If you sold all and gave it away to the poor, how could you have any left to provide well for your own? Believe it or not, even the greatest saints who ever lived did not fully understand the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Why do we have all these denominations? Why is there all the fighting over doctrine? Why are there so many disputes over baptisms, doctrines, and morals? Simply because men today are still confused and uncertain. You may think your church has all the answers the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But it is not so. No one has it all. We are still in darkness about so many things. We all eventually reach a place, as King Jehoshaphat did. The enemy comes against us all. Some put on a big front, as though they have no fears, no questions, no problems. But they are the ones who inwardly fight the worst battles. Often, those who judge everybody else and who appear so holy and righteous before others are waging a war with lust deep inside. Yes, we are all hurting in one way or another. We are all in need. We all reach that point of panic when the heart cries out, What do I do now? Some people think I should not confess that I too have battles. But I do get spiritually dry at times. I do get plunged into darkness and confusion on occasion. With Joseph, I can confess, the word tries me. I am no better or worse than any reader of this book. The saintliest people hurt too. I know what King Jehoshaphat was going through. I've been there when I had to cry aloud, I don't know what to do, so I'll keep my eyes fixed on him. You don't fold your hands, sit around at ease, and let God do it all. That's not what it means to keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. We look to the Lord not as people who know what to do, but as people who do not know at all what they must do. We do know God is the King who sits on the flood. He is Lord of all, and we know even if the world breaks in two, even if it all falls apart, He is a rock of certainty. Our eyes are fixed on a risen Lord. If we do not know what to do, our faith assures us He knows what to do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian, pictured the Christian as someone trying to cross a sea of floating pieces of ice. This Christian cannot rest anywhere while crossing, except in his faith that God will see him through. He cannot stand anywhere too long or he will sink. After taking a step, he must watch out for the next step, 
Beneath him is the abyss, and before him is uncertainty, but always ahead of him is the Lord, firm and sure. He doesn't see the land yet, but it is there, a promise in his heart. So the Christian traveler keeps his eyes fixed upon his final place. I prefer to think of life as more abundant and joyful than that. I picture life as a wilderness journey like that of the children of Israel. And I picture King Jehoshaphat's battle along with all the children of Judah as our battle. Sure, it's a wilderness. Yes, there are snakes, dry water holes, valleys of tears, enemy armies, hot sands, drought, and impassable mountains. But when the children of the Lord stood still to see his salvation, he spread a table in that wilderness and rained manna from above. He destroyed enemy armies by his power alone. He brought water out of rocks, took the poison out of snake bites, refreshed them with rain and dew, led them by pillar and cloud, gave them milk and honey, and brought them into a promised land with a high and mighty hand. God warned them to tell every following generation what it says in Zechariah 4, 6, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. A reporter asked me to respond to a question about pressures on the church from the IRS and other government agencies. Isn't the IRS trying to tax all evangelical ministries? Won't that day come when the government will strangle missionary and evangelical outreaches? What will you do then, seeing that these things are already in the works? I replied, We are going to be forced right back into doing the work of Jesus the way he did it himself. The day will probably come when I and all my minister friends will have to quit doing evangelism like big business and get back to New Testament methods. We will be priced out of expensive methods and go back to walking the streets with sinners as Jesus did. As long as our eyes are focused on Jesus, no one will ever stop his message from being preached. That is why Jesus said, I am the way. Stop searching. Stop looking in the wrong direction for help. Get alone with Jesus in a secret place. Tell him all about your confusion. Tell him you have no other place to go. Tell him you trust him alone to see you through. You will be tempted to take matters into your own hands. You will want to figure things out on your own. You'll wonder whether God is working at all. There will be no sign of things changing. Your faith will be tested to the limit, but nothing else works anyway. So there's nothing to lose. Peter summed it all up in John 6:68. 6, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Hebrews 12:2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Isaiah 45:22, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Isaiah further says in 51.1, Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn. Micah 7.7 7 says, Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Psalm 112.7 says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And Isaiah 50 verse 10 says, Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. You've been listening to chapter 10 of Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately? Read by Jason Staples. This podcast is brought to you by World Challenge. World Challenge is incredibly thankful for the support we receive from many people across the country who believe in our mission. We're able to continue creating resources like this podcast because of donations from listeners like you. You can make a donation at worldchallenge.org. Thank you for listening and supporting. On the next episode of Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately? God can use you in spite of your weaknesses. Until then, we pray that you find hope and healing in the midst of discouragement.